welcome to everybody and thank you so much for coming on the um, <laughs> first win day of winter, Tanil said, right? Yes, I think so. Um, if you haven't been here before, welcome. If you have been here before to our programs, welcome back. Um, this is a program of the American Jewish Historical Society. Uh, we are one out of five organizations that are housed in this building, the Center for Jewish History. And the American Jewish Historical Society specifically is the oldest and biggest um, Jewish American archive in the country, in the US at least, and also the oldest and biggest ethnic archive. So um, this is us, AJHS. Um, so we're really, ha we're, we're home to over 30 million documents, photographs, a lot of them are dig digitized. You can go online and, and, and check them out. Um, we have something here for everyone, really. Uh, and and besides our, our wonderful collections, what we do here, um, this is one of the programs. We do run cultural and academic programs. And we do try to um, touch in the programs on various subjects, again, something for everyone. Um, so mostly American Jewish identity, culture, and the arts, but really the emphasis here is on identities because American Jewish identity is not one, and it's not what we have in mind when we think, um, when a lot of people think, or oh, the, the commonplace image. And uh, our talk today is gonna be, um, about that too, one of the one of the topics that we're going to raise is that what is American Jewish identity. Um, so I encourage you to come again to our programs. Uh, we have flyers downstairs, so you can see. Um, we have an exhibition also um, on display now by Rachel Lipskind called "Holy Trash: Mike Niza, which is a contemporary. Uh, intervention in the idea of Gniza and also um, a commentary on Solomon Schechter's work uh, downstairs so feel free to stay and check it out while you're taking some flyers and seeing what's um, upcoming next. Um, and I'm Shirley Bachar, I'm the Director of Cultural and Academic Programs and I'm very very happy and very honored to have with me today Tanir Oxman and um, Liana Fink by my side, and um, we're here to celebrate um, Tanir's uh, book, new, kind of new book, right? It's, it, it just just came out basically a few months, yes, a few months ago at Columbia University Press, How Come Boys Get to Keep Their Noses, and I hope you get an answer to that and to many other uh, unanswerable questions tonight. Um, so basically, we're going to hear from both uh, Tanir and Liana, and then we're going to just open it up to conversation between us, but also with you and some Q&A. Since we're such a small uh, crowd, we can have it more free-flowing, you know, and spontaneous, um, which is um, the good thing, I guess. So uh, I want to start by introducing Tanir, sitting next to me. And she is an assistant professor and director of the academic writing program at Marymount Manhattan College. She has written on women comics, Jewish identity, and the visual arts for publications including The Forward, The Los Angeles Review of Books, Lilith, The Comics Journal, Paper Brigade, The Clever Magazine, and more. Um, at The Clever Magazine, she's also the graphic narratives reviews editor. How Come Boys? This is her first book. Uh, and she's currently working on a new project that is going to explore representations of absence and loss in contemporary literature. And I guess this is contemporary American Jewish literature? Or? The new book is going including but not only Jewish literature. Oh. The new book is including but not only but Jewish not only. literature. Okay, so really something to look forward to. 
And um, I want you to really talk about your book. You're going to talk about your book. You're going to present some images from the book, um, but also talk a little bit about the making of it, how you came to start thinking about it, and also, you know, how is it in conversations with other books, with other things that are happening in the American Jewish cultural scene today. One thing I kept thinking about reading this and uh, uh, you know the uh, the multiplicity of the American Jewish selves and kind of like the reorientations and disorientations of the self is our uh, exhibition Schmatas that we had here um, of uh, t-shirts that have like Jewish kind of funny slogans like you little hora or uh, vodka and latkes and, and that kind of thing and, and uh, Jewish American young secular identity so um, yeah, just start talking about your book and then how you made it and how you came to make it and how you place it in today's scene. Okay, great. So I'm gonna focus today, as uh, Shirley was saying, more on the making of the book. Um, and you know, if you're interested, there are a couple of copies for you to purchase if you're interested in <laughs> reading more. Um, but really, I'll focus on how I came to this subject. Um, so when I first, you know, decided while I was a PhD student to write a book on Jewish women in comics, um, my mentor said to me, well, why are you trying to marginalize yourself? You're triply marginalizing yourself. You're writing about women, you're writing about Jews, and you're writing about comics. Um, and what had really happened is I, let me just check the time to make sure I don't go on. Um, what had really happened is I had started out interested in um, memoir. So to me, what's really interesting about memoir is how do we, um, why are people so compelled to write the story of their own life? How does that um, transform the way that they come to see themselves? If you think about it, we all have stories, even if we don't end up publishing those stories, we all have stories we tell other people. Those stories change depending on the context. So if you're you know, talking to a grandchild about um, who you are or who you came to be who you are, that story is going to be a lot different from if you're standing in front of a group here um, talking to a bunch of people about who you are. Um, so really, I was just very interested in this question of why do we tell these stories and why are people so compelled to read other people's stories about memoir, about who they became or who they think they are. Um, and what I started to notice is that, for how many of you read memoir, are interested in memoir, have read memoir? I think we're in the memoir age, so there's a, probably a fair number of people. Whether or not you realize that you're probably engaged in a lot of memoir, auto, biography, including biographies of others. Um, and what I started to realize is there's a lot of images involved in these autobiographies. So oftentimes you'll read a book, the story of someone's life. Um, the, a photograph will be in the book. Oftentimes um, the cover, there's an image on the cover. Um, or sometimes you'll see in autobiographies, there's like a couple of photographs within the book. And at least for me, the way I, that I often read autobiography when there are photos in the book is I flip right to those photos. <laughs> I look at them even before I start reading and then maybe I start reading the book and I keep flipping back to the photos. And so one of the questions that we can ask is what are those photos doing and how are they telling the story of someone's life differently than words tell that story? Um, what was so compelling to me with comics is that you're getting images and you're getting words but they're mixing together. And the really important thing, I think, to take away about comics, so the name comics can be deceiving. It is very deceiving. Comics are not necessarily humorous. Um, one of the books I'm writing about right now for my second book project is the story of um, someone writing about their parents' aging and death. Um, it's certainly not primarily a humorous story. Um, what comics is, is it's a medium where people use images and words together to tell stories. It's simply a different way of telling stories. So for this project, I started to, or the way that I came to this project is I started to realize, wow, I'm reading a lot of memoir. I'm really interested in the image aspect of memoir because even when there aren't pictures or when it's not necessarily made up of comics, if you read a memoir, there's a lot 
of image in memory. So even if a person is just describing something that happened to them in words, if you think about your own childhood memories, it's very visual. So even if we're not explicitly talking about images, there's something very visual about thinking back to the past and trying to put that past together to tell a story. Um, and the other thing I started noticing, so beyond just being really gravitating towards um, visual memoir or memoirs with a lot of imagery, is that all of the books that I was curious about happened to be by Jewish women. Now, I grew up um, at going to an Orthodox school, so an Orthodox Jewish day school in the Bronx. I had to wear skirts to school. I had to pray. Um, technically, girls only had to pray two times a day. Boys had to pray three times a day. Um, and, you know, half of my day was Jewish learning. It involved um, Hebrew texts, talking about them, thinking about them. And as soon as I graduated, I had a lot of um, discomforts about some of the traditions that had been passed along. And it really, it took me some years to fully um, accept how uncomfortable I was and why I was so uncomfortable. One of the, one of the moments that were really um, formative for me and in, in what I now think about as like breaking away from Judaism, although obviously I came back, um, one of the formative moments was in 10th in, um, grade being told I'd been really interested in drama in singing, um, and I was told, well, you can't sing in front of an audience because there's this halachic rule where a girl over the age of 12 is not supposed to sing in front of an audience. So there were several moments like that that made me really uncomfortable with certain aspects of Jewish identity, but here I was, you know, 15 years later in graduate school um, thinking, well, all of a sudden I'm drawn to these Jewish texts. And so as I continued reading, and especially as I started to find the comics that I'll, I'll show you a couple of, the, couple of the images from the women cartoonists that I eventually found, one thing that I noticed is that a lot of these women had really conflicting um, relationships with Jewish identity. And so I started to think, well, if you're not necessarily someone with religious beliefs, right? If your Jewishness is not formed out of your religious beliefs, then what is your relationship to your Jewish identity? And as I started to look through some of these texts where women would talk about their Jewish identities, but not necessarily or not always in you know, a loving way, um, I started to realize that um, there are you know, a lot of Jewish women, and I think particularly um, not only, but particularly in more recent generations, what I call post-assimilated, Jewishness, um, who are identify as Jews, but in some ways that identification starts with a kind of rebellion, right? So it starts with, let's say, a proclamation that, well, I'm a feminist, and then I'm a Jew, right? Or, um, you know, I have some conflicting feelings about Israel, but I'm also a Jew, right? So this notion that you can have these sort of conflicting, contradictory notions of what Jewishness is um, or what it means to you. And the other important thing is that Jewish identity changes over time. So that was something that I was noticing in a, what these autobiographical cartoonists were doing, is they were showing how their own relationship to Jewish identity, not only were there some contradictions even within the present moment about these different aspects of Jewish identity, um, but also that over time their feelings about Jewish identity, just as mine had changed over time, theirs changed over time. So the first image, this is an image I talk about in my introduction, and to me it's sort of a, a kind of prototype for um, what comics can really do in terms of thinking through identity. So I was, this happens to be a cartoon. So comics, technically, the definition of comics is that it's a sequential art, which means that you have images and words on a page together in sequential order. So if you think about, you know, even newspaper comics that you've seen, they're telling a story over time. And this is technically a cartoon. Um, but what I found really interesting about this cartoon is it's sort of a prototype for um, the way that I think about Jewish identity, which is very much based in a notion that a religious studies scholar named Stuart Charmé, he teaches at Rutgers, um, a notion that he outlined in an article that he wrote some about 15 years ago. 
Now, Stuart, Char Stuart Charmé, when he talks about Jewish identity, um, he talks about two types of Jewish identity. So he talks about the more conventional Jewish identity, maybe the one that we're more familiar with, which he, I love this title, he calls it the drink your milk identity, um, Jewish identity. So basically this notion that if when you're a kid, you're given Jewish education, you're taught Jewish texts, you're around Jewish people, you, you know, eat all the Jewish food, then your bones will be strong as you grow older, you're setting a foundation, and then when you're older, you'll strongly identify with your Jewish identity. Well, guess what? That wasn't true at all for me and for a lot of people I knew. That wasn't uh, a model that really fit with our, our experiences. So in relation to this, Stuart Charmé posits um, an anti-essentialist identity, which he thinks about as a spiral model. So it's a model that thinks about how both in the present moment, we have contradicting feelings about our Jewish identity, not only on the personal level, but also if we think about like a larger Jewish body, there are different Jewish people, different Jewish communities who have different notions of what being Jewish is. And then over time, again, both on a personal level, but also on a broader historical level, um, the way that we think about Jewish identity changes over time, right? It doesn't stay static, and it's not all headed towards this perfect, idealized, adult Jewish identification. Um, and this model seemed really complex. And when I found this cartoon by one of the cartoonists I write about in one of my chapters, her name is Lauren Weinstein. You might have seen her cartoons lately in The Village Voice. She's recently been published. Um, and I found this cartoon by Lauren Weinstein, and it's called The Best We Can Hope For. It was published in 2008 in this um, arts and literary magazine called The Gonsfeld. Um, it's no longer around. But what I found so beautiful about this image is if you look, first of all, with comics, with images in general, the closer, with good images, the closer you look, the more information you can really yield from the image. So I could stare at this image for hours and just glean more and more information. And the more you look at this image, you come to realize there are four main characters. Um, I don't have my laser pointer today, but if you can kind of see the woman at the top left in the yellow shirt and the jeans, if you can just even trace her trajectory along the path of these ima this image, you can kind of see her going through all these stages. Eventually, I don't know if you can see on the top right corner, so she's alone at first, then she encounters a guy, they do something in the bushes, she comes out, and eventually she rolls over and has a baby right there on the playground. Um, so there are all these stages that are sort of juxtaposed together. And this really seemed to me a, a nice way of thinking about that model of Jewish identity um, that is really based on this notion that Jewish identity is rooted in perspective, in the way that we are, um, in the ways that our individual backgrounds allow us to think about who we are and what we are in relationship to the world around us. So if you think about what identity is, what any identity is, notwithstanding Jewish identity, um, it's partly how other people see us and it's partly how we see ourselves. And so this image, I think, nicely shows how the intersection between those two things, but also how our own positioning at different points in our lives yield a different perspective. So this is sort of how I position my whole book. I, I use this image as a kind of starter. I also just think it's really beautiful. Um, I remember the artist told me how her dentist, <laughs> she visited her dentist, and he, for whatever reason, had seen this beautiful image which came as a poster, and he asked her if he could hang it up in his office. So I talk about seven different cartoonists in my book, um, Liana is the final concluding chapter, and, and to me, Liana's book, A Bintel Brief, is a kind of way of thinking about the future of this model of Jewish identity. Um, and Liana will talk about her wonderful book just after me. Um, but Aileen Kaminsky Crumb, to me, it, she calls herself the grandmother of comics. Um, so she was really important early on in the underground comics movement, which, which started in the early 70s. Um, and this is her memoir from 2007, which incorporates a lot of different comics that she published over the years. 
Her first comic, Goldie, which I talk about, was published in 1972 in something called Women's Comics, which was the first ongoing anthology of comics by women. Why did women create their own comics anthology? Well, because they weren't being included in the other anthologies, which were not men's anthologies, but they basically were men's anthologies. So what really interested me about Aileen kaminsky Crum is she was growing up in this post-war generation, which really differentiates her from the other cartoonists that I read about. Um, so her work, I think, is really interesting because she doesn't always explicitly talk about Jewish identity, but if you look really closely, you start to see these Jewish symbols coming out. So here is Goldie, a neurotic woman, which is considered the first autobiographical comic ever written by a woman in, the United, in the North America. And if you can see in that second panel where she has the curls and that bow in her hair, she's actually wearing a Jewish star. And what really interested me here is, you know, this is a book about how we come to see ourselves over time. So at first, Goldie, in the beginning, I felt loved, it says there at the top. Then as time unfolds, look at what happens when puberty hits. That's how she feels about herself, right? So that's her sense of self. Whether or not that's how everyone else sees her, that's her sense of self at that time. And so... You know, I looked at this comic and I thought, well, what does Jewish identity have to do with it? And sure enough, on a later page, we see this large Jewish star behind her um, and her mother next to her say saying, thank God he's Jewish. This is the first guy she married who happens to be a Jewish guy. Um, and eventually that marriage does not work out. <laughs> so in this case, the Jewish star really came to symbolize a sense of... Um, uh, a sense of feeling tied down to something when you're not necessarily um, invested in that thing, right? So the opposite of a sense of creativity or a sense of independence. And if you look at the rest of Kaminsky Crumb's work, I think it's a really compelling, interesting way of thinking about Jewish identity. So this is her comic that the title of my book comes from this comic called Nose Job. Um, the full title is Just Think I Could Have Ended Up Looking Like Marlo Thomas Instead of Danny If Only I'd Had a Nose Job. And on the left side, you can see what she, the way that she typically draws herself. Um, and then on the right side, you can see what she would have looked like had she gotten a nose job. And what's really interesting is, you know, in comics, you're drawing yourself over and over again on the page. Now, if you're, if you're not using digital technology, if you're actually drawing yourself Every time you draw yourself, it's going to change a little bit, right? Which is interesting in itself to think about how the self changes over time and how a person's sense of self changes over time. Here we see how without the no or with the nose job, it's not just that the nose looks different, but the nose symbolizes something more than that. So she loses the peace symbol, right? And she looks m much more uh, mainstream or you know less progressive. Um, and, you know, the story that she tells, which I'll end with this story so that we have enough time for Liana, um, the story she tells is growing up in Long Island in the 50s and feeling this pressure to acculturate, um, and all of the young women around her were getting nose jobs. So you can see there, there's the Dr. Silver. She could recognize the doctor by the nose. So there's the Dr. Silver nose, there's the Dr. Diamond nose. And she and her friend there, um, it says, me and my pals developed a big nose pride. So there's a sense of claiming um, non-conformity through not getting a nose job. Um, eventually what happens is even her best friend who didn't get a nose job gets a nose job and she really feels like an outsider there. Um, but what's really interesting to me about Kaminsky Crumb is in some ways, that non-conformity was her way of claiming Jewishness. And that's the common theme that I see, that I saw in a lot of these artists, that in some way a rebellion against a broader Jewish community or um, a stream of Jewish thinking was what helped these women claim their Jewish identity. And the last thing I'll say is um, all of the cartoonists that I'm interested in, you might notice Kaminsky Crumb's style. It's often described as unsophisticated, scratchy, um, and this is a very conscious thing that she does. So in a way, with her autobiographical comics, I think what she's trying to do is show how she feels through the drawings. Um, it's very deliberate. She's a trained artist, and actually in her memoir, she incorporates in her memoir, Need More Love, 
up, she incorporates portraits that she does um, and other things that look very different from her comics. But I think part of her project is playing with form in order to um, play with questions of identity and to try to draw how she feels inside. So, and um, her husband is Robert Crumb, who's a very well-known underground cartoonist. And I thought it was very interesting. She incorporates um, comic collaborative comics that she creates with her husband, and you can really see their different styles here. And you know, a lot of what they're playing with is stereotypes of Jews. So she married a non-Jew eventually after that first Jewish husband. So here, they're, the two of them are playing with stereotypes of what it means to marry a non-Jew, right? Um, and I think in a way, what Kaminsky Crumb shows us is how we, in, we tend to internalize a lot of these stereotypes no matter who we are, either if we're on the Jewish or non-Jewish side of this interfaith relationship. We internalize these images and in some way drawing these stereotypes um, can help us claim power over them, right? It's a way of saying, okay, I know what it, what it is that has helped me think of myself the way that I think of myself. I'm putting it out there in order to move past it. And I'll just show you one more. This is probably her most, um, the image that's talked about the most, the most controversial images of hers. This is her mother here that she draws a kind of Jewish mother monster. And one of the things that I argue in the book is that she draws this mother monster again in order to talk about how, as Jewish women, we internalize a lot of these stereotypes about Jewish mothers. Um, and one way for her to get past it is to put it in dialogue with these other images about motherhood. All right, so I'll let you guys sit on that one a little bit. Okay. Thank you so much. I have a few questions, and I'll keep them for later. Um, but now I want to I wanna present uh, to you, introduce to you Liana Fink, who, as Ed Nir said, her conclusion of the book is actually particularly addressing uh, the Bintel Brief, uh, Liana's, Liana's book, and it really beautifully talks about um, the experience of immigration and, and kind of like Im embodying two worlds both at once and really um, a, a beautiful depiction of how the narrator kind of loses orientation in his um, kind of fragmented, but I'm sure Liana will say more about that. And uh, Liana Fink is, um, her, her, so her graphic novel, A Bintel Brief, that the conclusion is about, was published by Echo Press in 2014, so just recently. And um, her cartoons appear regularly uh, in The New Yorker, so maybe you've seen some of them. They're very minimalist, they're very edgy, I would say. And uh, I'll let uh, Liana take it from here and talk more about um, her cartoons, what brought her to do this work. Thanks, Shirley. Thanks, Tenure. That was the best talk I've heard in forever. Um, can you all hear if I speak very quietly like this? It's my natural state. So um, raise your hands if you haven't heard of a Bintel brief. Good. because. I've never not had to explain it before. Um, a Bintel brief what <laughs> was um, a Yiddish advice column that ran in in a um, social socialist Jewish New York newspaper that was very popular and important called The Forward starting in the early 1900s. It was a newspaper for, for Yiddish-speaking people who were new immigrants, first new immigrants and then later old immigrants to New York um, who came here not speaking English. And it was a good thing that helped make the community really strong and help build unions for these really poor people to have power and climb out of their poor community and stop speaking, stop, um, needing the community anymore because they had assimilated very quickly. So it was this very like fierce, intense community kind of built around a newspaper that that was very intense for maybe 
40 years or so before it started to wane. And Abintil Brief was, I think, the center of the, the forward newspaper. The newspaper and the Bintel Brief, the, the advice column, were both started by the newspaper's founding editor, Abraham Kahan. And he was, he, he was kind of um, an, just like a, an all around brilliant and mean person who was, was, grew up very poor in Lithuania but refused to, to like fit into the little very religious yeshiva boy box that his parents had picked out for him and that every other boy in his community did. And he kind of like climbed, climbed out of that and became an intellectual and he had all these phases and his last phase was as a communist and he fled Eastern Europe because he was part of a group that helped murder the czar and he came to New York and, and he started working in factories and um, and one day he found his way into, into a, a, a socialist meeting hall and he was just this like total newcomer but he climbed up on a box and started speaking to the people in Yiddish which was unheard of in those days. The socialists spoke higher languages like Russian and they were really speaking to the educated people about the working people. The working people didn't speak Russian. And he started speaking in Yiddish. And, and so he started this kind of spin-off, this r real people's movement that was a spin-off of the fake people's movement. And a Bintel Brief was this, this unheard of thing where he had people write into the newspaper. And it was seen as very lowbrow because these people were very uneducated. And they wrote in with their terrible problems, and he answered them. So in my book, also called A Bintel Brief, I took 11 of these letters. Some of them I took from a book that, that was a, a collection of Bintel Brief letters that were already translated into English. And some I took from microfilm and had translated by a Yiddish translator. And I adapted them into comics. It feels like ancient history. It, it wasn't a fun book to make. I was trying very hard to be faithful. And I did each letter in a slightly different style. I was, it was my first comic, and I was trying really hard and really earnestly to learn the st to find my own style. But I, I chose the right project for this, I think, because, because I was trying to channel different people. So the different styles kind of work. I'll read you one. A Mad Barber. Dear Mr. Editor, if anyone had ever told me that I would someday write to the Bintel Brief, I would have laughed at him. Things are going well for me. I have no unfaithful wife. I am not in love yet. I have never done anyone a wrong that would be on my conscience, and yet I come to you for advice. I am a barber and have been practicing the art for 10 years and became quite adept at it. Sounds good, yes? But the following happened. A few weeks ago, on a quiet afternoon, when there were no customers and the boss was out somewhere, I dozed off while reading the Police Gazette. And then there's our first sign that this guy is pretending to be someone else. The Police Gazette is an English language newspaper, and yet he's written in, when he has a real problem that he needs to share, he's dropped the facade of being this all-American guy who reads this potboiler newspaper, and he writes in Yiddish to the Yiddish newspaper. So that that's, this theme runs through this letter a lot, and also runs through all the other letters that I chose, and I think runs through a mental brief as a whole. A lot of the people who wrote to this newspaper were about losing their community and their language and their family and their, their religion. Because um, my great-grandparents didn't even read a Bintel brief. They were religious people. Um, the Forward was a newspaper for people who had come here and let go of everything. It was, an it was a kind of anti-religious, culturally Jewish newspaper. And I think a lot of these people didn't give up religion for political reasons. They gave it up because they were so poor that they had to work on Saturday. And then in the middle of the book, I have, I, 
it's a long story, but I put etchings from another feature in the forward called The Gallery of Missing Husbands, which was a spin-off of a Binzel brief. There were so many women writing in to say that their husbands had, had disappeared in the new country that there was this whole, whole section that would just be photographs of men and people who read the newspaper would keep an eye out for these men. It's, it's often an epidemic in, in cultures where there's a big wave of immigration that um, marriage is split up. Maybe the men come over first and then they sometimes just vanish and leave their wives not knowing what, what happened. And then when people are really poor and desperate, sometimes sometimes the men vanish because they want to and sometimes they vanish because they're just like, they can't, they can't make money and they don't know what to do. I really liked making this story about, it's kind of magical realist about me opening a notebook that that my grandmother owned, um, and the ghost of Abraham Kahan comes out, and he at first like you expect it to be this like warm like book about about this like pleasant Jewish fellow like getting the like wayward Jewish girl of our generation to see how great Judaism is, but actually it's more about me wanting something and not knowing really how to find it, which is how I really feel. So she ends up chasing him, and it ties, ties into the theme of the missing husbands, because she's like wrenching these stories out of him, and eventually he, he just kind of wanders off into the, the present day, and she's left bereft with only her grandmother to keep her company. Um, just kidding. And, <laughs> and that's that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So my first question is for Tanir. I'm looking at the images and, and just um, reading through the book. Um, and there's this, uh, there's this one thread that you actually mentioned in the introduction, this idea of, again, secular American Jewish identity and the idea of not wanting to affiliate yourself with Judaism, the uh, unaffiliated Julie. I'm unaffiliated Julie, right? That's how you put it in the introduction. And I'm just wondering, um, what would you say, um, in light of that, is the relationship uh, of these uh, comics artists and women comics artists specifically with um, with white America, with WASP uh, culture, with white privilege in America, as well as with the uh, uh, pressure to become white or you know to assimilate, but specifically to become white, right? To become this like, uh, European oriented, <laughs> orient, European oriented person that um, that speaks um, American English, and no one can actually notice that they're anything but white American. Um, and what is the spectrum of criticism? You would say, and I think uh, the answer is already in the images. Did you say? Uh, did you show with this? Uh, white America, white supremacy, maybe we can call it, um, yeah. Um, so first I would say, is this, this is on, right? I, yes. Um, so first I would say, it's not that they're unaffiliating, it's that they're unaffiliating Jewishly. Um, so it's an affiliation that starts with the rejection of some or many things. Um, and, you know, thinking about what post-assimilation means, I think it's very connected to um, a, a lot of what, particularly the younger generation, but also Aileen kaminsky Crum, a lot of what their work is doing um, is trying to say, as Jews, um, it's a kind of critique of this notion of Jews as other. Um, so I think what a lot of these women are trying to say is, as Jews, we are part, we are privileged, right? We are white. Um, even if nowadays women are not generally as often getting nose jobs and men, um, we have become mainstream. We do have these privileges. And so part of that disaffiliation, and I put a hyphen there in disaffiliation, is to say the recognition that as Jews we're not necessarily, especially in America, victims first is a way of saying that connects us with our Jewishness. In other words, to recognize that Jewishness doesn't necessarily paint us as victims, but it paints us as people who in the past have been on the margins and now are somewhere else. That in itself is how these 
women are identifying as Jews. So I, I really think that a, a huge part of this notion of disaffiliation is recognizing, and you know, a lot of um, the background that I did, I thought a lot about a book by his, a historian named Karen Brodkin um, titled How Jews Became White Folks, uh, Matthew Fry J Jacobson. So a lot of historians write about how um, you know, in post-war America, particularly with the GI Bill, Jews were all of a sudden moved up that chain, the hierarchy, um, and they became white in many ways. They could, they could assimilate, they could pass. Um, nevertheless, as you can see in a lot of their works, they're still engaging with Jewishness. So this is not to say that um, they feel that they are, you know, fully assimilated. They still want to identify as Jewish, but they want to look at that identification from a place of recognizing their own privileges. Right, but I mean, they are not identifying, they're not affiliating themselves with the Jewish faith. You talk about that too. They affiliate themselves with something that's much more secular and much more ethnic and also racial, right? In some way, it's both, it's self-reflexive, both giving white readers what they want and also criticizing them, or like holding a mirror against them, saying this is what you think Jewish is, this is what Jewishness became as an ethnicity in America, um, and we have a difficult relationship with this. Um, but in any case, this is also what you want us to how you wanted to sh us to show ourselves. L I don't know, that's, that's the sense I'm getting at least. I mean. In, in what, in the sense. Yeah, maybe with the first um, cartoonist I showed you, Aileen kaminsky Crum, who's really different from the other authors. So the other authors, I didn't show you some images from a, a woman named Vanessa Davis, who's a really wonderful cartoonist. Um, and, and the rest of the cartoonists that I write about, they are not dealing in stereotypical images. It's a very, um, you know, if you think about like a, um, the post-feminist, the notion of po post-feminism, I don't think we're in post-feminism, but this notion that we're sort of beyond um, engaging with uh, feminism at this really basic level, like we're, we're beyond having to say men and women are not equal, now we can be a little bit nuanced about where those inequalities are. Um, I think it's the same thing with the later Jewish artists. So Aileen Kaminsky Crum is the only one who's really um, engaging with these like grotesque, monstrous images. Um, so you know, based on that, maybe I, I would say the same thing. But if you look at the later cartoonists, they're much more nuanced in terms of um, the what they use to symbolize their Jewish identity or or even Jewish symbols. So for example, Lauren Weinstein, who had that opening image, she has this wonderful piece in her book where she talks about herself as a young girl and she draws herself um, alongside her friend Diana. And she never explicitly says you know, that they're both Jewish, but they both have these qualities, they both have dark hair, um, they both have, um, one has a widow's peak, she doesn't have a widow's peak, and she distinguishes herself from Diana by saying, I have a bigger nose than Diana. Um, so it becomes more about thinking about difference in relationship, not just to non-Jewishness, not just to whiteness, but kind of all the nuances in between, even within the Jewish community. Great, Great thank you. Liana, thanks for your presentation. So. Um, one thing I was thinking, and this is in line with uh, what Tanir is writing in her conclusion about your, um, your book, is about the narrator and kind of like the dispersed and fragmented voice and how we don't exactly know who she is, where she's talking from, where she's located. Um, if you could talk a little bit about that, like what it symbolizes for you, what it signifies, what you wanted to do with that. Um, yeah, so first of all, I'll start with that. Yeah, I, um, Tanir wrote in her essay about my book that the narrator lives in this world without a lot of detail, and, and I think that, like you say, that that kind of it symbolizes why she needs so, so much from this ghost of Abraham Kahan, because like she lives in such a vague world. I 
did, didn't do that on purpose, but um, but I've actually it, it was so meaningful when to read when you wrote it because I've been realizing like like just like this year that I do that totally and I think part of why this book was so hard to write is that comics are really difficult. You, um, it, it really feels like a science to me and I, I do not feel like a scientist. I feel like a wild animal or something. I think I'm, I'm less, um, less punctilious and and coolly noticing than average as opposed to more. And I'm the last person who should be able to draw the same person a, a thousand times because all people kind of look alike to me and all places kind of look alike to me. And I, I really notice things, but it's not not the usual things. I don't notice um, whether what color a car is and I don't notice um, what, what color someone's hair is. and. Um, and and now now when I make comics, I I just draw my people like really really simply, and it works a lot better. And I try to draw as few people as possible sometimes. And I think I think this was kind of the beginning of that. And you the stuff it. that I can't draw is imagery, and the stuff that I can draw is also imagery. But the imagery I can draw is facial expressions, whereas the imagery I can't draw is the shape of a car and Spider-Man rushing through space to save some something. Right, so limitation is really, I would say, a theme here, right? Like, I mean, to so human limitation, right? So and exemplified in, in, uh, in the drawings, in the comics. Yeah, maybe I'm a limited person. No, that's what I tried to I, say. But I think what you, I think I'm a limited person who made this book who actually which actually should have honestly should have been written by someone else. I, I have a really complicated relationship to Judaism. I, I relate more as um, we, really weird. And I went to Jewish schools where actually people like post, post weird Jewish were um, really loved being Jewish. And I just, could, and no one ever talked to me. I had no friends. I didn't look at someone until I was 24. Um, so really, I think everything I make is about that. But I w in a way, I was using it as a metaphor for Judaism. And I think you're picking up on that. And I think it's a good metaphor. Thank can, you. Can yeah. I ask Liana a question? Of course, yes. Um, I want to ask you about that, because I think a lot about what it means to write a Jewish book, right? a book that's explicitly Jewish. And your New Yorker cartoons, they're not themed around Jewish. You're not the Jewish New Yorker cartoons. They're all secretly Jewish. Right, that's am, what I was going to ask. I'm the most them. Jewish. I mean, <laughs> some of them claim to be Jewish, but I'm the real Jewish New Yorker not cartoonist. Ben um, so do you feel, where do you feel more at home? Do you feel more at home in like this explicitly Jewish context or in this sort of uh, more hidden New Yorker, I'm the Jewish New Yorker cartoonist that you didn't know was the Jewish New Yorker we're, we're all Jewish, actually, at the New Yorker. <laughs> not not everyone. No, but this is a good point and a very important detail, right? We're all Jewish, but we're all American Jewish, and this is a, a, a big industry that's very popular and very dominant. Yeah. So where do you feel more at home? I mean, does it make you uncomfortable? For me, I feel sometimes uncomfortable when I'm, you know, talking about my book as a Jewish book, even though it's very Jewish and there's Jewish in the title, but oftentimes I want to say, well, actually, it's a really feminist book, yeah. or actually, it's really about memoir or about the visual. Yeah, I'm so curious to hear what you think about this. I think you're, like, you're changing my thoughts on Judaism more, more than other things. I started to feel Jewish when I, I made this book because I... Um, I mean, I, I only thought of this book because it was a grant application to for this Jewish grant called the Six Points Fellowship, and I'm so glad I thought of it. I just wouldn't I wouldn't have gone there otherwise. But it it was this small community of of technically Jewish, very intense and and selfless art people, and I just like I felt so at home with these very shy people, and it was really the first community I felt at home with. I was 24. Um, and that that was something I keep finding I keep finding pockets of Judaism that I feel at home with, but never quite as much as 
as with art people or with comics people, and it's a shame. And and I think all the, I think a lot of Jews feel that way. I I I always felt like I needed to avoid Jewish stuff, and I actually felt uh, earlier I felt like I needed to avoid feminist stuff. Did you used to feel that way with either of those things, and then like have a an awakening, or did you always gravitate? Never with feminism. Um, with Jewishness, yes. I, I, at, when I started graduate school, I told myself, I'm not writing about anything Jewish. I don't want to make my parents happy like that. And there was even a time where I thought, I'm never going to marry a Jew. And then I met a Jew, and I got married to him. Um, so yeah, I had those moments. And I think you know a lot of that is just the natural like wanting to break away from parents who want to keep you really close. But I think it's also, um, it was also a response to my upbringing that equated Jewishness with these sort of rules that didn't make a lot of sense to me. Like what I mentioned before, the Kol Isha rule, even prayer to me. You know, I like the idea of, of, some, of having something, some sort of meditative or spiritual aspect but I don't like the idea of affiliating. Um, I remember for my 10th year college reunion, I was invited to come back and speak, and the talk that I gave was that I'm not a, the kind of person who comes back for reunions because affiliations make me really uncomfortable. Um, so maybe that was part of it, sort of, I guess the individual aspect of wanting to like formulate my own, or at least feel like I was formulating my own path. Um, yeah. 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 Do you feel like you're refusing to be shut out of out of things, and you're saying I'm going to reinvent the thing so that I feel comfortable in it? I mean, I did for a while. Now I'm less resistant because I just don't have the energy for resistance anymore. <laughs> I guess. Um, but I don't know. I I think it's it's a work in progress, right? Like I have young children, so. Um, I'm still sort of thinking, you know, one day I think to myself, well, I don't want to force them to go to synagogue because I went to synagogue and I hated it. And I, you know, I would play games with my sister, but like the, all the games were about how much we didn't want to be there. Um, and, I, you know, I felt like what, for me, were the, games? the more interesting, <laughs> I'll tell you later, the more interesting aspects were. Welcome to stay were really when I started to rebel against it. But of course, you need something to rebel against. So, um, and also some of the Talmudic learning, I think, ended up being really valuable to me. The people who taught me really, um, that was the difficult aspect. It was often male professors who treated me, you know, in retrospect differently from their male students. Um, and the laws and the texts that we were reading were very male-oriented. But again, like, you need something to rebel against, so, you know, and I did end up circling back. Um, so yeah, I think as I get older, it's less about rebellion. Do you also feel your parents are both immigrants, right? Your, yes. Is your dad from Romania and your mom's from Israel? Um, no, my mom is from was born in Israel and her parents are Romanian and Czech and my father was born in Poland, immigrated to Israel and then came here. So yeah, that, that's, a really, um, that's a really important aspect of my identity, just this notion that you know, growing up, to me it felt really normal to have parents who um, had accents and you know, when I went off, when I applied to college, my my father, the only college he wanted me to apply to was Harvard, because he said, that's a great college, that's where you should go. So there was a lot of like doing things on my own terms, um, and the differences would come about when other kids would come into my home and say, you know, you guys cook fish for breakfast, that's gross. So that it was really fish. a process of learning through um, encountering others. It sounds delicious. <laughs> Your parents are an immigrant. No, so for me, Jew, I, I, I actually think I'm less rebellious than you. Like I, I, Judaism was never the problem. Like the kids at my school were the problem, and the people, the very normal small communities where there was only one shy artistic person, and that was me, was the problem. So it's more that I'm rebelling against like 
small town in suburbs, and I, I actually always loved Torah and, and stuff, and I love Yiddish culture, but it, it's just really frustrating, especially when you're a woman, when there's just like so little slack that you can take. You can't, I, like, mm -hmm. I think if I were a guy, I might just dive back into it and join yes. a small community, and I, I'm not doing that now, and I hope there is some way to do it, but I'm not sure what it is. Salman Shakhtar is, all, all, is also a lot more progressive, <laughs> weirdly, yeah. than where I went to school. May, maybe not more progressive, like, sophistication-wise, though. Feel free to stay and hang out with uh, Diana and Tanir. And I want to thank you very, very much for coming and congratulate you. Can really, I just add one thing? Le absolutely. Liana's book would make a really good holiday gift. It's so beautiful. So Tanir's book. <laughs> Oh, yeah, right, and I forgot, and Tanir has with her um, some flyers with coupon codes if you wanted to purchase the book, which you should definitely do. So she's happy to give those away. Um, and I don't know if Liana has some too, but if it's not, she, she will let you know how to. Oh, yeah, it's on Amazon. It's on Amazon. Thanks but so much. Down with Amazon. would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.